Welcome to 78.4, the podcast that helps you leave a godly legacy for future generations by showing you incredible things God has done in the lives of men and women around the world. If he can do those things in these people's lives, imagine what he can do in yours. I'm Bob. And I'm Matt. So, Bob, before we go on to the topic of the day, I think we got to mention the elephant in the quarantined room. Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone's life who has changed for now with coronavirus, we're not able to record in studio. We're doing the show from our separate homes, probably in our pajamas. No. <laughs> no? Well, maybe me. Who knows? <laughs> So forgive us. Your Spider-Man headphones I saw on video. You saw that. Okay. <laughs> yes. yes, they're my sons, but I am happy to wear them. Uh, so anyway, forgive us if the audio isn't perfect. Uh, we're, gonna, we're doing our best today, but we didn't want to break our time with you all. Uh, so we're here with you today, separated but together. So uh, on to today's episode, shall we, Bob? Let's do it. Okay. So today... We're going to talk about sharing your faith with others. The last thing that Jesus commanded was, go and make disciples to all nations. And yet, it's often the scariest part of the Christian life to actually do for many Christians, whether we're afraid to bother someone or how they might react, make fun of us. Yeah, especially the the whole idea of talking to somebody about Jesus for the first time. Yeah, I mean... I. And I get that. I, I, I get those jitters sometimes, too. But what's crazy is I read a survey that recently blew my mind. All right, what's that? There was a Barna survey that came out last year that said this. Almost half of practicing Christian millennials believe that evangelism, you know, what likely brought most of them to the faith in the first place, is Wrong. Is wrong? Wrong. Not that it's hard, not scary, but that evangelism is wrong. Can you believe that? It's kind of an incredible stat. How could anybody get to that? I know. but And then the weird paradox here, the good news, though, is in the same study, 95% to 97% among all generational groups believe that the best thing that could ever happen to people is knowing Jesus. So they, so they know that that's the best thing, and yet they, there's some people that just aren't connecting that to actually sharing that with others. Uh, so the question is, how do we combine what nearly every Christian does agree with, that the best thing in our lives is that Jesus is part of it, and add the command that that same Jesus made to share that love and faith with others who don't know him? As in, give people the same gift we as Christians say is the best part of our lives. How do we get to a point where we not only share without fear, but share well and with confidence? And that's what we hope to understand better today after hearing from three people who are asking exactly those questions of themselves. I've known people who were amazing at sharing their faith. Bill Bright, the founder of Crew, had stories of sharing with taxi drivers and people on planes and even folks who called his phone by mistake. But let me be totally honest here. I'm not that way. I, I I wish I was. I really do. But I'm a big time introvert. You know, sometimes painfully shy. Hmm. Talking to folks is not easy for me. Right. And yet I do want people to know about Jesus. I know what it's like to not have him in my life. And no one should ever have to go through life without knowing God loves them. He cherishes them. He died and rose again to free them from the death and guilt and shame of sin. So for me, when it comes to sharing my faith, there's always this little battle going on between the the shy me and the evangelistic me. Right. And uh, that's what happened to our first guest, Thomas Abraham. Now, Thomas is from India. He came to Christ in his 20s and went several years keeping a low profile, never telling anyone about his faith. But Jesus wasn't going to let him go on forever that way. I'd like to take you for a few moments of my first experience in leading somebody to the Lord. In uh, 1967, 
I joined Campus Crusade for Christ. They were giving the training in how to use the four spiritual laws and all on a sudden, you know, that they said that Tuesday that we are going to go out to the beach for two hours and try to share the four spiritual laws which you have already learned how to witness to people. And I just felt that, you know, I'm not ready to go. So I told them that, you know, I have a headache. So I didn't go those, uh, that day. But I didn't know that the Campus Crusade was so smart enough that they had another day of witnessing that is on Saturday. And that evening is the final rally on it. And so at that time, I said to myself that I have to go because, you know, I don't want to skip out the opportunity. So I went with one of the Campus Crusade staff thinking that, you know, that he will present everything and then allow me to just, you know, just watch and critique on it. So we went over there and uh, Long Beach, California and shorts on and uh, a clipboard in which we write up the, the name of the person and the information when we interview. And when we reached there, out of all the norms of Campus Crusade for Christ, which taught me, this staff member told me that, Thomas, there are two people. I will take that person and you take this person. And I was almost ready to punch him in that sense because I was not expecting to do that kind of a business at that time because I wanted to watch how he does it. But anyway, he moved on without getting my permission. He just you know, sat with the other person and started talking. And here I was standing. I looked at the person. I will never ever forget in my life the huge person who was lying down on the sand at that time. And I still remember that, you know, he had a, you know, that uh, green small bikini and a bumpy stomach, hairy chest. And looking at him, you know, and his eyes were so big and I was almost frightened. I couldn't even move. I was having the clipboard in my hand and the four spiritual laws, but I looked at him the second time and he didn't even pay much attention. So I was thinking that, you know, the whole floor is going down and down and down. So I was just thinking, what is ha going to happen? This is my last day. And then all on a sudden I felt that I should see whether how he respond and turn my face to him. And then he said, what do you want? And I almost, you know, fell at his feet. And I said that this is the end of my life. But anyway, I said that, you know, I like to read this book. I forgot all about taking the survey and I just start on reading the book. And I said that God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Then immediately he said, stop. Then I had the, the whole fear grip me and said to myself that this is the last day I ever been in a part of evangelistic thrust. And then he said that, you know, that nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. Don't tell me that God loves me. Then I thought that, you know, it's a good opportunity to start on talking to him. Make the story short. In 43 minutes, this person with tears in his eyes, he prayed to invite Christ. And that was absolutely throw me out of the, the you know, the, my comfort zone to do anything for the Lord because, you know, I never expected that he will say yes to the Lord. And uh, he was a PhD student at that time in, uh, in, the, in UCLA campus. And uh, he came, became a Christian professor after that. I was so, so thankful to the Lord that he gave me that experience. And that is the person who was shivering like this when he was first introducing somebody to the Lord is the person now God transformed my life because of his faithfulness and because of his love and because of his, his grace. It's absolutely incredible to put the trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord always and lean not to your understanding, but commit your ways unto the Lord and he will do it. And he is doing it. That is the way we could say that. And I'm so thankful and thankful to the Lord for making me the way that I am because he is the one who works miracles in the lives of people. You know, Thomas's story doesn't end there. Right. He and his, his wife, Molly, they went on to 
open all kinds of ministries in Asia, and uh, they led cruise ministries in Asia for for years, and millions of people came to know about Jesus because of what God did through them. He was just such a sweet, really cool guy, but what a lion for Jesus. Right, and it's incredible to know that he kind of he starts out like many of us, who's just scared and like, "What? I can't do this," and then he ends up exposing millions throughout his life. It's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty but, amazing. Yeah. Now the idea of cold witnessing, like Thomas was made to do on that beach, some people bristle at, and I get that. You know, I do. I do too. <laughs> just the idea of just walking up to someone. So how do we? make it natural in in life? How do we get into that mindset? Well, our next guest, Gladys Hillman, who is one of my favorite people we've had the pleasure to talk to over the years, she had a similar issue, specifically making sharing your faith natural with people who were different than herself. So here is her story. I, I didn't mind sharing Christ in a uh, like control environment when I was with students or with somebody else. And I had no idea that there was a fear in my heart in sharing with people not like me. And, uh, and then I was asked to travel uh, to recruit for a conference we were having. And I got to thinking, I said, now, what if <laughs> there are going to be white people sitting on the seat with me? Am I going to share with them? Because you see, where I was in my hometown, white people didn't share with black people. I worked for a pastor, white pastor, and he never shared the gospel with me. So I just assumed that, you know, we share with our people, they share with their people. So um, I remember when I first got on the plane and I saw these three gentlemen <laughs> sitting there and they were all white. And I'm, all of a sudden I thought, I can't share with these guys, number one. I don't know what they think about African Americans. But in my heart, I kept thinking, God, why? I need for you to help me. Holy Spirit, will you have them, the person that you want me to talk to, initiate the conversation? And if you would do that, I promise I will share the gospel with that person. And every individual that I shared with, that person initiated the conversation. Well, after a while, I at the, at the, t at the uh, last leg of my journey, I figured, well, you know what? I've overcome <laughs> my fear. And, you know, the fear of rejection and the other thing was the fear that they was going to ask me some questions that I was not prepared to answer. And I was just so amazed at the openness and, and how they were listening intently as to what I had to share. But on this last trip, <laughs> I decided that I would just give the man the book. I made a promise to God I would share the gospel with the with the gentleman if he initiated a conversation. And he did. But I just said, you know, I just want to give you a little book that will explain to you how you can know Jesus. And he said, fine, thank you. And put it in his pocket. Well, on my way back, <laughs> when I get to the waiting area, I look over and I see this man. And the thought just went through my head like, wouldn't it be interesting if we were sitting on the same seat going back to Atlanta? And just sort of laughed it off. I walked on the plane. 
I looked up to see my seating, and I looked down, and this man went, oh, no. <laughs> and we both almost said it at the same time. And the stewardess said, uh, is anything wrong? And he was like, oh, no, no, nothing is wrong. So I sat down, and I'm thinking, oh, Father. I know why you are you arranged this seating again. So he said to me, he said, what's your name? <laughs> I said, Gladys. He said, now Miss Gladys, of all my travel, I have never sat on the same seat with a passenger twice. He said, now, if God went through all the trouble to get you and I back together again, what do you think he wants you to tell me? I sat there with my mouth open and I said, sir, there is something that he wants me to tell you. So I pull out that little full old booklet and I said, you know, God wants me to share with you, not just give you this book, how you can have a relationship with him. And this man sat there intently listening as I shared the gospel with him. And of course, the gentleman on the other side, <laughs> on the other side of me was listening intently as well. He did not pray the prayer to receive Christ. He said, but I'm going to take this book and I'm going to reread it again. And I want you to know that I will never forget this trip. And thank you for sharing with me. And I said, sir, let me share with you um, a little of my story. So as I shared with him my story, how God saved me and how much he loved me and the, my family situation, I mean, it was an incredible trip. And what I learned once again that, one, is that there are people who whose hearts have already been prepared by the Holy Spirit to hear the gospel. And now when I'm out, um, it doesn't matter what color that person uh, might be. And God says, no, everywhere you are, there is somebody that I have prepared for you to talk to. Whether I'm at the grocery store, whether I'm, you know, at the laundromat, wherever I am, God says, I desire to tell people how much I love them and how I long to have a relationship with them. There are a lot of great points in Gladys' story, but sure. the one that stands out the most to me is when she said, there are people whose hearts have already been prepared by the Holy Spirit to hear the gospel. Yeah, it, It's a good reminder that this isn't something that we have to produce on our own. It's not like God is desperately depending on us, and if we don't get it done, all of eternity is lost. Nah. No. He's in charge. He has a plan. The Holy Spirit is already working in folks' hearts, and he invites us. He gives us the privilege of taking part in his redemptive plan. What a gift. Right. I mean, way of life evangelism is really just using every opportunity God gives you to share your story. Share what God has done in your life and can do in theirs if, if they want them, knowing 
knowing, like you said, that the Holy Spirit is with you while you share and ready the person beforehand. Yeah, and the other thing is that as far as stories go, is that as far as Gladys knows, the man she shared with didn't come to Christ. Now, I'm not happy that he didn't come to Christ, but it's a great reminder that not everyone we talk to will. Right. You know, all right, Matt, do you know what Bill Bright's definition of successful witnessing was? I do not. What is it? Going forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results up to God. (laughs) What a relief. All I have to do is rely on the Holy Spirit and let him do the work, which is a lesson learned by our last guest here, Paul Eshelman. I got involved with Campus Crusade for Christ at Michigan State University when I was about a junior in college. I wanted to be involved with them because they really cared about others, and uh, they just had a different kind of quality than I'd ever seen in any Christians in my own church, my youth group. We were kind of walking around with an eternal inferiority complex. But uh, these were uh, college students who really loved the Lord, weren't afraid to talk about Him anytime you were there. And uh, it was during my time there, I began to attend the weekly meeting, and the topic was the Holy Spirit. And I thought, oh man, this is so dull. I never went back again to the, to the training class. I had, uh, as a child, received Christ, but if there was a carnal Christian, that's exactly where I, where I was and didn't want to do anything about it. The Vietnam War was building then, and I thought I was going to get drafted, and so uh, I went back to my home in Florida. To My idea was to enlist in the reserves, go to meetings and so forth, so I wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. And when I arrived back in Florida, they, uh, a girl that I had been dating previously said, we need some counselors for this high school youth camp. And I said, well, I'm not sure I'm cut out to be a counselor, but if you need a lifeguard, you know, I could lifeguard. And they did, and so I became a lifeguard at this church camp. And about the third day of the camp, this gal came to the pool one day and began to talk to me. And she said, you know, Paul, The people that are here that uh, are your friends don't really respect you because you're just fooling around with Christ and Christianity. When are you going to get off of the fence? Pick a side. And uh, I just got mad. You know, I'm giving my time. You think you're so holy and I'm so unholy and so forget it and I'm leaving and I left the camp and went home. But all I could think of that whole night is, Paul, what are you going to do? with Christ. I couldn't, uh, I tried to read, I couldn't, I tried to watch television, I couldn't. And finally about three o'clock in the morning a verse that I had heard as a kid went through my my uh, head. Pharaoh hardened his heart and so God hardened it. And I began to be afraid because it had been a long time since I had been uh, soft enough to work in my life. And um, you know, that, that was a turning point. And I had always resisted giving my whole life to the Lord. I was involved in things that I knew were sin. But that night, finally, about 3.30, I'd been fighting all evening, and it was just me and God in the room. And I finally got down on my knees and said, Forgive me for my sins. If you're not in my life, I want you to be in my life. And... Uh, Tonight, I'm telling you, I'm giving you my whole life. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll give away whatever you want me to give away. I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'm done running my life. I went to sleep. Next morning, I woke up and thought, what do you do after you just give your whole life to God? So I I started going to this Bible college. It was in Miami. And I had heard that my friend, the staff member from Michigan State, had been assigned now as the new director at the University of Miami. So I called him up and I said, Eddie, I'm on your side now. Anything I can do. And he said, well, we're having three fraternity meetings tonight with Andre Cole in uh, each of these fraternities. So if you want to go in, why don't you go to the meetings with us? So we go to the fraternity and we do these. uh, I was in on the first two meetings. And after the meetings, Eddie gives me all the comment cards from both fraternities, 40, 50 cards from each fraternity and says, 
Nobody will ever follow these guys up unless you do it. I've got three fraternities of my own to follow up. So I said, well, you know, I don't know how to do this. I'm, I don't know how to be a witness. And he said, well, the staff girl here, Doris, will teach you how to share the four laws. So I said, okay. And of course, in those days, we didn't have any booklets. So we had to write them out on the back of a, of a letter. And uh, we, would, we would write down the four spiritual laws. So I learned how to do that. And I brought my, my breath mints. I practice uh, in front of the mirror. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, you know, and I always try to look pleasant. And then I started calling up the cards. And I'll never forget the first card I went to, to see, a guy named Pete in the ATO house. And I shared the four spiritual laws just like I'd been prepared to do. And, and I got to the end and I said, Pete, do you think this is something you'd like to do to receive Christ as your savior? And he said, no, I don't think so. He said, that's uh, good you guys come around the house, gets us thinking, but I'm pretty happy the way I am and I'm, I, I think we're okay. So I go back over to staff guy Eddie's apartment. I go, Eddie, I, I can't do this. I don't know what went wrong. Here's what I said and he just didn't want to, he wasn't interested and you better take these cards back because I'm not making any progress and I'm, I don't think I'm cut out for it. And he said, wait a minute it's not your job to talk people into receiving Christ. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. I said, Eddie, you better tell me about the Holy Spirit again. Remember, I dropped out of the class at Michigan State. And he went through the ministry of the Holy Spirit with me and I prayed to be filled with the Spirit. Well, the next night I had this other appointment set up with a guy in the Sigma Nu house. They just had the annual toga party, it was just his wall was papered with nudes and, you know, and as I'm walking up the, the, the walk to the front, I'm thinking, well, I, I want the Holy Spirit to speak through me. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, I don't know how this works, but if you could talk through me somehow, I want you to do that tonight. And uh, when I went in there, I said, my name's Paul, and I'm John. And as I was sharing with him, he would ask me questions and I would remember verses of scripture that would exactly answer his question. And I thought, this is really something. I better not think about it or it'll go away, which was the Spirit speaking through me. And I got to the end of this presentation and I said, John, do you think this is something you'd like to do to invite Christ to come into your life? And I look over at him and there's, there's tears coming down his cheek. And he's, this is what I've been looking for all of my life. And my heart was, just beating and I said, okay, well, I'll pray prayer and you can pray after me and, and I'm, dear God, thank you for dying on the cross and right in the middle, I remember it should be Christ, so it came out, dear God, uh, uh, Christ, thank you for dying on the cross for me. He prayed right after me, dear God, uh, Christ, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And we got to the end of it and I said, okay, welcome, welcome to the family. I'm your brother now. Do you have a Bible? No, I'll bring you a Bible tomorrow. And I tear off to Eddie's apartment. You know this works. You can ask the Holy Spirit to speak through you and he really will. And I think that day I just, that's, that's what I want to do. And I, I was never the same after that. That was the beginning of me uh, finding out what incredible joy there is in helping people to come to Christ. Okay, I didn't want to say anything of leading into Paul because I didn't want it to taint the way you heard the story. But you should know his passion for Jesus kept growing, and so did the scope of his ministry. Yeah. Before you knew it, he wasn't just telling students about Christ. In 1972, he organized Explo 72, a gathering of 85,000 people in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, where... Teenagers and adults from all over the U.S. and several countries were trained to share their faith and then sent out to do exactly that. And then he went on to other great projects, but the biggest by far was when he oversaw the production and for years the translation of the Jesus film that came out in 1979. As of January of this year, more than 572 million people wow. indicated they decided to give their lives to Jesus after seeing that film. Wow. And that's just one example of the power that comes and what God can do through you if you just let him. Right. And, and in fact, to, to add to Paul's story a little bit, 
Dory, the the lady who taught Paul how to share his faith, I and you, Bob, have had the pleasure of oh, knowing yeah. her 40 years after that happened. Absolutely. And and what I find really interesting is she works in, or actually she just retired, but she worked in archives. Yep. She She wasn't someone who was out in the field, so to speak. She didn't have a giant ministry or anything. But what's amazing is if if one person didn't share their faith with Paul or if one person like Dory didn't show him how to share his faith well, the effect of literally millions would be different or at least Paul wouldn't have had the amazing opportunity to be part of it. So you don't have to be the one to evangelize the millions like Billy Graham or Paul Eshelman. But but if you're open to to talk with anyone anytime, seeing everyone you talk with as a divine appointment, you can be the one who shares your faith with the one who has the gifts and the position. It's all about us being obedient and open to whatever God wants to do through us. And the moment we are, the sky's the limit. You know, God moved a shivering, sniveling Thomas out of his comfort zone, and transformed him into a lion for Jesus. And Thomas reminded us that God is the one who works the miracles and transforms the lives of his people. And Gladys brought us back to the fact that the Holy Spirit is already working in people's lives. Even people you would have never thought you'd be able to reach on your own. All we have to do is make ourselves available. And finally, Paul I loved when he ran to Eddie saying, you know, this stuff works. <laughs> you can you can ask the Holy Spirit to speak through you, and he really will. God doesn't send us out alone. Instead, he's already there, and he invites us to join him. Yeah, and, and as far as worrying about how others will react to you sharing, uh, two things come to mind personally for me. First— it reminded me of an episode of Seinfeld. It's, <laughs> it's one of my favorite shows, so it's very easy to, okay. to, to recall things. There was an episode where Elaine is dating a Christian, and she gets, at some point in the episode, furious when she finds out he's a Christian and he never shared his faith with her. Basically, she's saying to her boyfriend, not that you're right, because she didn't agree, but if you think I need Jesus to be saved, don't you care enough to tell me? Uh, as in if we believe we have the cure to sin and death and separation from God, why wouldn't we share it? Have you ever seen the vlog from uh, Penn Jillette? No. I like Penn Jillette, though. Penn Jillette is a world-renowned magician, an ardent atheist. He talked at one point about a guy coming to him after one of his shows and giving him a Bible. And Penn said he, that he was not offended by that because... He said, if you really believe right. what you're talking about, if you believe that I'm going to hell if I don't accept Jesus, how much must you hate my <laughs> guts not to tell me about right. it? I, I compare it to like a cancer cure. Heck, at this point, maybe more poignant today, the coronavirus. If you truly right. believe you have the cure to a disease, would you ever keep it to yourself? Would you ever hide it? Of course not. I mean, just just like Penn said, you'd have to be a monster to do that. If you believe you have the cure, you'd want to share it with anyone who knew who had the disease, everyone in the world, really. And yes, maybe, maybe they ignore you. Maybe they disagree with that cure. Maybe someone hears your coronavirus cure and thinks it's silly. It won't work, whatever. But if you tell them with love... Who is really going to be angry with you for trying to help them, save them, offer them hope? And even if the worst case scenario, they laugh at you, tell you to go away. You believe this will end the disease. You believe that faith in Jesus will cure yours, my separation from God. So I, I don't think you should be ashamed to declare that in love. And you know what? You have no idea if in the moment that went bad for you, you planted a seed that cultivates and grows into something that makes them ready to really hear the next person about the cure to sin, that Jesus died in your place for your sins, offers eternal life with him, and to change your life now here on earth. 
there is nothing about that message that should be difficult if you believe it. So that wraps up our episode on sharing your faith. It was great being with you guys today. Even in these very strange situations. <laughs> yes, even when we're trapped in our houses. Please go to our show notes. We have links to articles, tools, and even a couple of apps to help equip you to share your faith in Jesus. Please check them out. And as always, the audio you heard today comes from some of the more than 400 and growing videos on our website, legacy.crew.org. That's legacy.cru.org. We also have a YouTube channel, Crew Legacy, and a Facebook page. So please check it out. If you like today's podcast, we ask that you please subscribe so you can get the next one and the next one and the next one. Also, please rate us so we know how we're doing. 784 is a podcast of Legacy, a project of Crew. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week for our season one finale where we'll talk about what it means to live out our faith and make a difference in the world. And while we're away, we want to encourage you to remember that whatever God did in the lives of the people you heard speak today, He can do in you. So until next week, go out there and continue the legacy.